Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, it is that time once again for dads watching sports. I am Michael Draper. He is Kyle Castles, and it is Sunday, January 10th. It is episode 47, Kyle. A lot of good stuff happening, but we are broadcasting live, as always, on the Dads Watching Sports Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and as of last week, the Off the Ball Network Facebook page. So uh, if you are out there and you're listening to the show, do yourself a huge favor. Get on your computer, your phone, whatever your little device is right this second. Go to Facebook.com or Twitter.com and search Off the Ball Network Give them a like. Check out not only our show, the live stream, but check out all the great content. Uh, you can go to offtheballnetwork.com as well and check out some of the great articles that they've got going on. Um, and we are we're very excited to be a part of the Off the Ball Network. Kyle, it is divisional round Sunday. We've got all no, the wild card. Wild card. Oh, excuse me. Wild card. Yes, yes, yes. I'm skipping ahead. Uh, wild card Sunday. All but one game. Uh, finished and this game's not even close. Well, hang. I mean, look, yeah. I might be a little distracted. The Steelers are, are working on it. They're down third and third and less than one, headed in with two minutes to go in the first half. I mean, they could get within twenty one by halftime. Yeah, but within twenty one, yeah, it would be uh, <laughs> would be quite the uh, turnaround there if the uh, if the Steelers are able to pull that off. But uh, we'll get to that and more on the NFL here in just a little bit. But if you are listening to the podcast, thank you so much for downloading each and every week. Uh, go ahead and hit that subscribe button on your uh, wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Give us a rating and review as well. It's it's just it's just a simple push to subscribe. Uh, so go ahead and do that. Uh, Kyle, we got a lot to talk about uh, this week. We've got a guest coming up after the break as well. But uh, a couple of things I wanted to get into. Uh, you know, there's there's been a lot going on uh, this week in and outside of sports, um, and we will we'll get to a lot of that. Uh, and I know that you know with with everything going on in our world, really, there's only one really one topic that that the the, the country is just buzzing about. Um, and I'm sure. Oh, this is not a political. This is not a political show, man. We're dads. We talk about sports. That's right. Exactly. Who said I was getting political? What you t- what, did something you happen? Said, okay, go ahead. Maybe I'm wrong. Did something happen that I'm not aware of? No, no. Nothing okay. we need to talk about. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, so where I was going with that, what everybody's talking about, Kyle, is the bean dad. So ha- bean I've got to ask I've got to ask you, have you heard – of this bean dad and what exactly happened between this dad and his daughter involving a can of refried beans. I, I I've missed that. I don't understand. Okay. So let me, let me set the, set the premise here and then we'll, we'll get, we'll get our takes and, and exactly kind of what we would have done in this situation. So dad sitting in his recliner, watching some TV, we'll just say he's watching wheel of fortune. It's five 30 at night on, on a Tuesday night. He's watching. Can't watch wheel of fortune. Wheel of fortune comes out at six 30. Okay. Okay. Oh, family, family feud. Family feud. feud. There we go. Five thirty. Daughter's in the background. She says, "Hey, Dad, I'm hungry." And he says, "All right. Well, I want you. Why don't you just fix yourself some refried beans? You like refried beans?" And the daughter goes, "Okay, that's great. I'll do that. Where can I find them?" So the girl goes. She gets the can of refried beans. She gets the can opener, and she's like, "Okay, how do I do this?" When the dad says, "Oh, this is a teachable moment. I'm about to teach my young daughter." how to open a can of beans because everybody needs to know how to open a can of beans. Right. Yeah. I mean, you go on camping trips, you just need some beans. Who, who, who doesn't need to know how to do that? It might even not beans. Maybe like you want some, some greens and you get some can of greens. Yeah. So, so can the, of corn. So the premise here is dad sees an opportunity for a teachable moment. Daughter's hungry. She wants to fix herself something. Okay. I'm going to take this can open or open this can. So she tries unsuccessfully. Dad says, keep going. Tries again unsuccessfully. Dad says, keep going. And I, I can't remember the, do- the girl's age. I want to say maybe she was like eight or nine. Um, still trying. Six hours later, she finally figures it out. Nice. So my question to you, Kyle, this, and this has been blown up all over social media. People were outraged at this dad. He's had to offer an apology because he was, quote, starving his child. So my question to you, Kyle, is what's your take? And are you on pro dad team? Would you have let your child suffer for six hours without eating to figure out how to open a can of beans? 
Or would you let it go and just be like, all right, here, let me just do it. Let me show you. Knowing me, I would have just said, here, let me show you. Um, but here's my question. Before I get mad at Dad, was there other, like, was the only piece of food in the house a can of refried beans? No, no. So she could have, if she was really that hungry, put the refried beans and the can opener down and found something to eat that didn't involve a can opener. Yes, and 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 I'll be honest, I, I didn't get enough of the story to tell. Like, did she did she ask for something else? And he say, no, you have to get this. I, yeah. I don't know those details to be honest with you. Um, but let's just assume that she didn't ask, but that that, that was readily available. So, I, at the end of the day, if if she is dead set on having refried beans, and he's dead set on her being the one to open the can, well, here's the thing: if it's a teachable moment, then actually teach her how to open. The can of refried beans don't just say figure it out. See that that's that's my point exactly. Yeah, I, I'm all for teachable moments. I, I, we've talked on this show a lot about you know yeah. not quitting and figuring out ways to get things done. I do think the the six hours is probably a little bit longer than I would have gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be frank, um, I probably would have gone about six minutes. Yeah, and to say again, yeah, I completely agree with you in the fact that t- teaching teachable moment is is seeing that they're struggling and say, okay, well, here, let, let me give you a little clue, and then let's see if you can figure it out. Or here, let me yeah. show you how to do it, but I want you to physically do it. Right. Um, so so, so then I'll ask you this. Okay, so, so do you do you go along with everyone on social media who was upset with Dad for potentially starving his young child? And should he have had to apologize for being gate? I, no, no. Um, one thing that I have noticed and th- this is where it does get a little political. So I appreciate you putting me on the spot here. Of course. But uh, you know love to talk politics. <laughs> uh, it's not so much politics. It's actually commentary on American society. Oh, um, we are here. <laughs> we have become a society of uh, uh, overreactors. Right. Um, you know, I made the joke about the political stuff because everybody wants to talk about what happened. Um, this past week, don't, don't act stupid. Um, there, everybody wants to talk about what happened at the Capitol this past week. And here's the thing. It's all an overreaction. Everybody is just upset about something. And if you don't have something to get upset about, you, people will go out and look for it at the end of the day. It's all going to be okay. All right. More than likely. Like it, Fine, more than likely. It's going to be okay. Um, the the girl ate. Um, I don't know about you, but I've gone six hours without eating. I think most people probably have. So I don't worry too much about... Um, I, I just don't, I don't worry about it that much. I don't think he was abusing his daughter. I think it, it, he probably could have gone about it a better way, but... It's not like he said you can't eat. He just said like if you want it, figure it out. Yeah. Uh, I think if she had said, you know what, I, I don't want refried beans this bad. I'll, I'll go find something else that doesn't involve a can opener. I doubt he would have like told her no. All I'm saying, and we talked about this all fair before the show, is we both had Mexican this past weekend. Those yes, we must did. have been some dang good refried beans. Like I want to know what kind they bought, where they. I, get you know them. what. Because yeah. we do a lot of homemade Mexican here in the house. I need to know where those refried beans are, man, because those evidently were worth six hours of trying to get them open. Look, if you tell me that there's a, a type of refried beans that, that causes people to say, you know what, I will work for six hours to get to them. I, yeah, we both need to know what these where these are. Yep, absolutely. Kyle mentioned it was a busy week. Uh, it's always a busy week in the life of a dad because you just got all kinds of stuff going on. Um, this past week was for us, it was kind of re- resetting or restarting on things, uh, really extracurricular activities. So we had swim lessons for both kids. We had gymnastics for our daughter. Uh, we had doctor's appointments this past week and all this stuff going on and trying to fit all that in plus work and daycare and life. Uh, how do you guys handle busy schedules? Because I'll tell you what we've had to do. We, we bought like this big planner thing. I actually saw it as an ad on Facebook and we just try to write things out at the beginning of the week and try to plan yeah. out the best we can. 
how do you guys survive it at the Castles household? We, I mean, it, it's it's a struggle. We we try to prioritize family time, so mm-hmm. we'll we'll do that first. Um, and we want to keep the kids. I mean, you know what they say about idle hands. So we want to keep the kids busy doing something. Um, we we it's a struggle. We don't play. Here's the thing: we have it pretty much a routine. And so we know what we're doing. It, we get crazy when, you know, my, Lauren's an attorney. We all know that. When she gets caught in a deposition, when she gets caught in court, I mean, just a few weeks ago, she was out, you know, about, a, I don't know, 30 minutes to an hour away, Lebanon, Tennessee, for those people that know where Tennessee is. She was out in Lebanon, Tennessee, and she was in court till 630-ish, um, and then locked her keys in the van when she was loading up to come home. So like those types of nights, that's where we really struggle for the most part. We just have a routine. Like this is trail life night or whatever, right? This is the night that Paul Paul gets the boys and takes them. And, and so we just, we have a routine and we just try to keep that routine going. So there's nothing that ever gets us really out of hand one mm-hmm. way or another. Yeah. Yeah, we try to do routines too. I think for us, one thing that really struggles is when when one or both of our work schedules are just yeah. ridiculous. Uh, and so, like my wife right now, she's got the biggest event of her year is on the 18th of this month, and so she's been working till six or seven o'clock every night. Um, and it's just you know you, you got to get that kind of stuff done. And so when you get yeah. all this other stuff thrown in, you have to try to find time to just take a deep breath get everything yeah. in uh, and go from there. Uh, one thing that we have started Kyle in our household, it's, it's funny. So our daughter, um, she normally likes to uh, end the evening with some sort of ritual activity, whether it be singing or reading a story or something. And we try to do those types of things. Yeah. Well, now she's kind of gotten to this point where she likes for us to tell a story. Um, and, you know, I'll be honest, my, uh, my, you know, nursery rhyme slash stories are not exactly the most up to date as possible. Um, so the first time she did this was probably about a month ago mm-hmm. and I'm like, Oh, okay. Story, story. And I got out Goldilocks and the three bears, but it was not even close to being like the actual story. I, I, I remember there was something about porridge. I remember there was something about <laughs> in the bed, uh, but did not really remember any other of the other details. Uh, and then I went straight into what was going to be Hansel and Gretel. And my wife gave me the look like, are you really about to tell our children a story about kids being put in an oven? Um, so I had to, I had to uh, stop that one quickly. So how story time, man, are you able to, uh, let me let me ask you: could, could you share a story with our listeners right now? Uh, if you were I mean, on call, had to. If I had to share a story with you with the listeners, yeah, I could probably come up with something. I mean, I could definitely tell Goldilocks and Three Bears. I could tell Little Red Riding Hood if I wanted to. I will tell you who's actually really good at that, and that's my father-in-law. Okay. Um, the boys always ask him to read books when he's here, yeah. and if he doesn't have his readers on, he can't read any of the books to them. But he will sit there and make stuff up as he flips the pages. Nice. Um, I need him to, to to share some of that wisdom, some of that skill. Uh, I have a hard time just coming up. Well, with yeah, he, that. you got to be careful. Like you know, my father in law. Mm-hmm. Um, he he can get. I don't want to say inappropriate because I don't think that's the right word, but he can take it down some paths that you normally wouldn't go down with, uh, yeah, you know, a four and six year old. But it, it's fine. Sure. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I could. Here's the thing. Like you have a little girl. Little girls are easy to tell stories to. Once there was a princess and she was being captive somewhere. Right. (laughs) And she decided that she wanted to be free. So she fought the witch and got free and went home. And there was a handsome prince to help her. No, 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 no. This is the 21st century. She can do things without a man. That's right. I forgot about that. I, I don't forgot about that. <laughs> uh-uh. Look. All right. So I got. I got. I got to tell a story. Right. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's get this in. <laughs> um. The the last school I was at, I taught freshmen one year. Okay. And you know me well enough to know that I'm 
you give me 45 minutes a day with a group of people, it doesn't matter who the people are, 45 minutes a day with a group of people every day for, what, 36 weeks, I'm probably going to say some off-the-wall, like, crazy crap, right? You, you've done it on this show a couple of times. <laughs> I have. We're coming and, up in two weeks. And uh, we were – and so, like, I was world history, and I was teaching them towards the end of the year about uh, Chairman Mao, who was, you know, the communist leader of China, and he forced everybody to, to carry around a little red book full of, like, Chairman Mao's greatest sayings and stuff, right? Um, and so, at the end of the year, the class gave me um, Castle's big red book, and I said, wait, Chairman Mao had a little red book. They said, yeah, but you're fat. And so, they gave oh, me a big nice. red book. Nice. And I, it was actually pretty cool, but in it they put a lot of my they quoted me like I, one of the students literally wrote down every crazy thing i said in class and they put their select favorites in the book and not like it was a special book they took poster board and like stapled it all together right it wasn't yeah. but it, it meant a lot to me i still have it today um but we one of them was and i, I i'm sure i was talking about like you know, either feminists in the 1960s or or the 1920s, you know, uh, 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 suffrage movement. But the quote is, I don't need a man. Now, I ain't saying I don't want a man. I just don't need a man. Oh, boy. Right. So make yeah. sure your daughter understands she don't need a man. I, she can yeah. she can want a man, but she don't need a man. She she, she knows, uh, but I think you know she sees all these movies, and they've always got the handsome man coming to the rescue. Uh, speaking of coming to the rescue, Kyle, we're going to get into some sports talk because we, right, we need some rescue from uh, <laughs> from our dad life talk there. Um, Heisman reaction: Devonte Smith really kind of ran away uh, with the Heisman vote. Was, there, was that now. pun pun intended? Well, he wasn't running back, so you know. I guess you could say he. Yeah, but when he caught the ball, he ran away from people. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, this kind of blew out everybody. Uh, Trevor Lawrence coming in second. Uh, I think it was uh, Mike Jones and then uh, Kyle Trask. Yeah. Uh, any quick reaction to uh, Devontae being the first wide receiver since what ninety one? Ninety was it ninety one? I was yeah. thinking ninety three, but I could be wrong. Um, I'm just glad they got it right. There was no question he was the most outstanding player in college football this year. Um, so, yeah, I'm just glad they got it right. Yeah. Yeah, me too. I mean, we talked about it on the show last week. I mean, it, it that award has become the quarterback award of the best team uh, yeah. and not necessarily the best player. So it was good to see uh, them get it right for him. All right, Kyle, we said last week we were going to make our championship game predictions. Yeah, we're we starting the show off with that this week. I'm going to go first. Um, you know, I think uh, I think we talked a little bit about this on the show last week. I think Ohio State uh, played their best game of the season in the Sugar Bowl against Clemson. They had the revenge factor on their mind. They had all this stuff building up to that was the game they had circled. They had it in their locker room. They weren't so much worried about anybody else but Clemson. And I think that, the, that coupled with the fact that Alabama is just the best team, I'm going to take the Tide. If I had to predict a score, I'll say 40, 45, 24 tied. All right. Well, you gave me a few more things to talk about. So I'm, and I feel like this kind of breaks things down. Um, there's keys of the game. I feel like I said this last week. If I did not, or if I did, I apologize. It's going to come down to the line of scrimmage. Um, who can dominate that line of scrimmage? Uh, there's very little that I worry about on the Ohio State defensive line. There's some good offensive linemen on Bama's line. I love Alex Leatherwood, um, the, the tackle for Alabama. So I, I think Alabama has the edge when they're on offense and Ohio State's on defense. Um, when Ohio State's on offense, um, there to me, there's not a uh, there's nobody that stands out. I think they're good units. I'm not saying they're bad. It's just there's nothing that stands out to me. Um, so I call that a push with Ohio State's offensive line and Bama's defensive line, um, which to me up front gives Bama the edge. Now, if one group comes out and just plays really well, that could change. Um, matchups to watch. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Alabama just takes Patrick Sertan the second and and says like that is Chris Alave over there. You just go follow him. Yep. If Patrick Sertan can 
lock down Chris Olave, that allows Bama to keep an extra guy in the box. And if you look at the last two games Ohio State's played, the Big Ten title game and the Sugar Bowl, that second half of the Big Ten title game and the Sugar Bowl all came down to Trey Sermon running the football. Right. If Bama can keep a guy, uh, you know, drop that safety down into the box and say, we're going to man up everything else and outnumber the Ohio State offense in the box, Trey Sermon is not going to run the ball like he's been doing, and and that's going to be it. Ohio State's going to have to rely on Justin Fields making throws and receivers making contested catches. And so to me, let's see what the best receiver at Ohio State can do against the best corner from Alabama. Um, and I like Patrick Sertan there. So I like the Bama. I like Bama on, at the line of scrimmage. I like in the matchup to watch. I like Bama. Give me Bama by 10 to 17 points, like a 41 to 24, you know, 41, 28 game, something like that. Yeah, I think we're kind of in agreement there. Uh, Mo jumps in and says, Buckeyes greater than Bama, Buckeye Nation, and says well, my score was disrespectful. And look, I don't mean any disrespect to the Buckeyes. I think they're a great team. Yeah. I think Alabama is just a little bit better. Uh, or, or they're just a, they're just a notch above. Uh, and so I'll take the tide as well. Uh, so we will see how that transpires, how it all plays out, and we'll see what goes on uh, as we come back next week. It should be a fun game to watch, I think, without yeah. a problem. I agree. Uh, all right, Kyle, we're going to go to a quick break. And when we come back, we've got John Wilkham coming to join us. Uh, he'll be coming up with us after the break. So we will be right back on Dad's Watching Sports. Y'all stay with us. Big news in the Dad's Watching Sports podcasting world. You've heard us mention it on the show already. We are now part of the Off the Ball Podcast Network. We're super excited to be joining the team of great shows, hopefully adding a little dad flavor to the mix. You can check out Off the Ball Podcast and Off the Ball Network on all your social media sites. Just search Off the Ball Network. And while you're there, give them a like and a follow. You won't regret it. Welcome back to Dad's Watching Sports. Michael Draper, Kyle Castles. It is episode 47, Sunday, the 10th of January. Just got through talking College Football National Championship. Uh, it's going to be a good game, Kyle. I can't wait to uh, to get yep. into it. Also can't wait to get into our next conversation, and we'll bring on our guest at this time. John, how are you, sir? How are you doing? Hey, Michael, Kyle. How are you guys? Appreciate good. you having me on. Absolutely. We are, we're glad to have you on. So uh, first off, just tell us a, a little bit about yourself, and then I want to get into a uh, prediction for yourself and see who you have. But tell us just a little bit about yourself. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess the reason I'm talking to you guys is um, I wrote a book called Walk on Warrior that I published a couple of years ago um, after essentially taking notes and kind of writing a diary about my basketball experience, um, playing at Marquette, uh, working with the Milwaukee Bucks, coaching high school basketball around the country. And um, 13 years of notes, eventually I thought maybe I can give this to my kids someday. Um, but there was just kind of something digging at me that that this could be could be more and might be impactful. And I got a lot of young people if I were to come out and kind of share those things. So um, decided to publish the book in 2018. And um, the book is just um, it's, it's really kind of a culmination of a life in basketball. And so um, really excited to talk about the book. But, um, you know, more importantly, I kind of lived a life of sports. You know, I, I grew up in a tiny town in Wisconsin. Um, you know, basketball wasn't a big thing. I, I went to a high school where football was kind of everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how, kind of had to navigate those waters as a, as a basketball enthusiast. Um, got a scholarship to play Division II basketball. Um, left after a year to kind of pursue my dream and play at Marquette, which was a school that was near and dear to my heart. My father went there. Um, it was the school that I wanted to to go to and the team that I watched growing up. Um, so anyway, a lot of meaning kind of behind, uh, behind why Marquette and, uh, why it meant so much for me to play basketball there. And I think that kind of comes out in the book. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we talked about being from the big 10 country, so I'm sure you've probably got a, you've got a watchful eye on the national championship game. Uh, any prediction from yourself on the Buckeyes versus the tide? Yeah. I mean, I hate to, uh, just go along with, with what you guys said, but, um, <laughs> I don't see any way Alabama loses this game. To me, they have better players. Um, Saban's been around forever. Um, you know, in these big games, they don't seem to make a lot of mistakes. Um, and in the past, you know, I thought Clemson had a little bit more speed, you know, the last couple of years. Um, but to me, this Alabama team is deep at every position. They're athletic. 
And I just think some of their star power, I mean, if they're not doing it through the air, you know, Najee Harris is no scrub in the backfield. So um, I just, I don't see an area where you can just say, Hey, we're going to take this away and, and Alabama's going to struggle. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, uh, we were both in the, in agreements with you there. I mean, I tell you for a, for a basketball guy, you definitely know your, your football as well. Uh, so you, you talked a little bit about uh, your career and, and all that, but tell us a little bit, you know, we're a, we're a show where it's called dad's watching sports. We talk about sports, obviously, but we talk a lot about dad life. You may have caught that when we were uh, talking about it earlier in our, our first segment. Uh, tell us just a little bit about your family and, and kind of what that looks like and how, how that all kind of plays into, you know, who you are and, and what you are doing now. Yeah, it's mad chaos here in Minneapolis. Uh, my wife and I just had our second kid about two weeks ago. So I have uh, I have three women in the house now. Um, so I'm severely outnumbered. Um, and uh, I've, I've been, you know, going the last few weeks with with not a lot of sleep. So um, my wife is a champion. Uh, she's she's absolutely kind of kind of handling things. Um, but yeah, it's been a been a crazy couple of weeks. And um, I've got a two and a half year old daughter named Avery and now a, a two week old named Whitney. That's awesome. Kyle and I both uh, also have daughters. I've got a four-year-old. He's got what is now a little over a one-year-old, right? Yeah. Kyle? Yeah. She turned one uh, early December. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a house full as well. Uh, and we both have sons as well. And so, yeah, the the daughter is a, it's a different dynamic uh, than you would ever think. Has that been the case for yourself as well? Yeah, for sure. I mean, my, my daughter loves me, which is probably going to change here, you know, any time <laughs> now. Um, nice. But, you know, I'll enjoy it while I can. Um, my wife and I had our, had our first kid when she was in medical residency. So I feel like I always have a, a special bond, um, with, with my, with my daughter, Avery, um, just cause we spent so much time together when my wife was working kind of crazy hours. Um, so yeah, Avery loves to sing. Um, she got a little microphone for Christmas and, um, you know, no matter the, the time she'll, uh, she'll belt out a tune. Oh yeah. Uh, so on our show, we've talked a lot over the past, Really, half of the year uh, where you've seen uh, di- different instances from where whether it was at the Super Bowl last year with a, one of the female analysts for the 49ers uh, or you've had, uh, you know, Vanderbilt University had a female kicker this year. There's been a lot of women and females that have really kind of broken through, uh, you know, kind of those gra- glass ceilings in sports uh, as somebody who is, as you mentioned, spent your whole life in sports. Uh, I know it's got to be exciting for you to see uh, girls getting those chances as well. For sure. Yeah. I mean, my first uh, memory of, of basketball was my own dad, uh, coaching seventh grade girls basketball, um, at a school in my town just because he wanted to coach basketball. Yeah. Um, and I was like, you know, this guy is nuts. Like he doesn't you know, know any of these people, but, um, you know, he's getting after these girls to play man to man defense and, you know, to block out and all these things. And I'm, you know, three, four years old and getting yelled at for dribbling a basketball on the side of the court. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, been around the game a lot. Um, I was fortunate that I didn't have parents that, that pushed me into a particular area. Mm-hmm. And so that's something I definitely want to instill with my own kids. Um, but you know, once I had a passion for basketball specifically, um, also fortunate that they allowed me to kind of go in, and chase that. Um, yeah. and so, um, you know, no parent, I'm, you know, assuming loves to drive around, you know, every weekend, the entire summer and, you know, be in the gym instead of at the lake. Um, but man, the sacrifices parents make when you look back as an adult um, is crazy, especially nowadays when there's so many tournaments and, you know, just a crazy amount of games for some of these kids. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, so you talked a little bit about your playing career and, and kind of, you know, your mission, your uh, way that you were able to get to Marquette and that being kind of your dream school. So just talk to, to us a little bit about how that all played out. Why Marquette? Why was it kind of your dream school, uh, quote unquote, and then how that all ended up kind of playing out? Yeah. Um, so my dad grew up in a, in a smaller town than I did, uh, but about 700 people maybe. And, um, you know, he went to a smaller school originally for college as well. And then ended up transferring Marquette to, um, to become a physical therapist. And that was in the, the mid 1970s and Marquette's only, you know, one and only national championship was in 1977. So my dad was, was there during that time and Marquette's a basketball only school. So, you know, it was everything, you know, and even now, you know, 50 years later, um, it's, it's, you see those banners around campus, people still talk about it. It was a big deal. Um, and so, you know, if I was fortunate to stay up on a school night to watch a game at nine or 10 o'clock, you know, when I was a kid, I would only get to do it if Marquette was playing. Um, (laughs) so I remember guys in the early nineties, I remember Marquette beating Kentucky in like 
93 or 94 in the tournament. Um, you know, it was I'm a Kentucky fan. I, it was I, crazy. I remember you know, that one too. So. <laughs> and, I, and I know, I know you guys are, um, but you know, those were games where I was like, geez, you know, uh, just shocked. And then obviously the, the Dwayne Wade, Kentucky game, yep. everybody probably watched that one. But, um, you know, I got to play with, um, I, I came in right after Wade. Mm-hmm. Um, so I played with Travis Diener. I played with Steve Novak, a couple guys that, that, um, had pretty good NBA careers. And, um, you know, so much of what I wanted to put in this book wasn't like a culmination of stats or, you know, games and wins and losses. It was really to like, you know, respectfully take people behind the scenes and, you know, tell them like what a day in the life was, you know? I mean, the fact that I was up every day at five in the morning and went to bed at 10 and pretty much every minute of every day is accounted for when you're playing division one sports. And Kyle knows that. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's crazy when you look back and it's like, man, I'm chasing around a two and a half year old and I'm worn out at seven o'clock. Um, <laughs> and I look back at that and it's like, man, I, I couldn't believe I did it. Um, but mentally and physically, man, you just, you change so much um, over the course of your career. And I think a lot of people too, just forget that, you know, these are kids. Um, you know, when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, your maturity level, you know, you're goofing off and your coaches are trying to get you in line and, and trying to get the most out of you. And at the same time, like mentally, you just don't really understand that focus, um, until you're, you know, two, three, four years into a program. Um, so anyway, the book was written with a lot of kind of raw emotion. And as I said at the beginning, um, it was really written over a 13 year period. So a lot of the stories in there are as a player. Um, and then there's a lot of stories, you know, well after I was done playing and it's just really interesting to kind of see how your perspective changes as you, as you get older. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the book's called walk on warrior. Uh, any, any other than the fact that, that you were walk on any other significance to that title or how, how'd you come up with that or how'd that all come to be? Yeah. So, um, Marquette's, you know, mascot in the seventies was the warrior, uh, Marquette warriors. Um, you know, that was banned, I think in the early eighties. Um, Marquette actually, when I was a student there, uh, we were the golden Eagles Mm -hmm. and, uh, they famously tried to change it to the gold, the Marquette gold. Mm -hmm. I think it was Dwayne Wade who sent out a tweet that was just like gold in like, you know, bold letters with a couple question marks. And within 24 hours, it was changed back. Um, so it never, it never stuck, but I think a lot of Marquette fans will always think of Marquette as the Warriors. Um, those are prime years, Al McGuire days, um, and have a lot of fond memories when, when the Warriors were kind of all over the, uh, the jerseys and such. So, um, that was kind of the motivation for the name. Um, and then the other part was just, you know, I think everybody that plays any college sport, to be honest with you, you know, has to have some type of warrior mentality. Um, it's not about going through practice, you know, one, one day or one week. Um, But to do it over an entire year, um, you know, whether it's strength and conditioning or being in the training room or, you know, taking care of just kind of a bruised and battered body and still doing well in your classes and, you know, trying to eat right. And I mean, there's just there's so much that goes into it that, um, man, you can come out of there. And I think just mentally um, you could do whatever you want to do after going through a division one program. Yeah, absolutely. So we're talking with John Wolcom of the, uh, he wrote the book Walk on Warrior here on Dad's Watching Sports. Uh, so John, I, I'm guessing you played for Tom Crean. Is that right? I did. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what it was like to play for, for Coach Crean. Yeah. Uh, super enthusiastic, crazy intense. Um, you know, I've heard from people that he's kind of backed off of that in the last few years. And, you know, um, I, I think he kind of, you know, he got a little bit, I'm not going to use the word soft, but I think he got a little bit, um, maybe it wasn't quite as intense at Indiana, you know, at Georgia, it seems like he's a, he's a little bit more maybe in touch with his players. Um, but he was notorious for running really long and hard practices. And, uh, you know, we used to joke, um, Steve Novak's locker room was right next to me and Steve had a great career, um, with the Knicks. And, you know, one day at practice, uh, we were doing a three point shooting drill and the goal was to make as many threes as you could in five minutes. And I would basically just stand under the hoop and rebound for Steve because he hardly ever missed. But um, he made 73 out of 75 threes that day. And you're just like, wow, you know, this guy is an elite level basketball player. Yeah. And regardless of like what happens here, he's going to he's going to make money from the game. Um, but anyway, Steve used to joke with me that um, when Jim Beheim was recruiting him at Syracuse, they would get in, they'd warm up, stretch out maybe an hour on the court go over some plays and stuff and bam, like within an hour and a half, 
they were done, you know? And I think we used probably every second allowable by the NCAA um, <laughs> with, with Crean. So definitely a different philosophy that way. Yeah. But both had, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of really good success. So you can't really fault uh, either coach in, in that regard. Uh, we'll tell everybody out there that's, that's either watching or listening where they can find uh, walk on warrior, how they're able to get it. Uh, and uh, yeah, everything with that. Yeah. Um, so like I said, I, I published the book, I self published it two years ago and you know, when I, when I wrote this book again, I thought maybe I'm going to give this to my daughter. It was more of just kind of a fun side project. Um, and my wife was in a medical residency and I thought, you know, I can watch, you know, 150 games on NBA league pass this year, or I can like buckle down and finish this book. Um, so I finished the book, I put it out there, you know, I didn't care if I sold one copy. Um, but it's just been a, a crazy response. Um, the, the book is still the, the second best selling college basketball book on Amazon. Um, and it's just been crazy. The, the responses I've gotten from people, um, honestly, all over the world that have, you know, found some sort of motivation or, um, there's a high school, you know, kid or middle school kid that was like, shoot, you know, I've got the same dream and, you know, my town doesn't care about basketball either. And, you know, I took a lot from the story. So, um, the book's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, um, really wherever you buy books. Um, but again, the, the goal is to, just to put something out that was authentic and hopefully relatable. Um, and there's some funny stories in there too, of just where, where basketball took me. You know, I, um, I randomly met Aaron Rodgers in a bar, um, at one point. And, um, not only did we talk for a while, but he asked me to play Buck Hunter, uh, the video game. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I beat him in Buck Hunter. So that's just a testament to my Wisconsin hunting roots. But, nice. um, yeah, it's, a uh, it's for sale on Amazon. Um, and um, I'm just proud of, of the reactions that have that have come through. But most importantly, hopefully some kids and, and parents and coaches get something out of it. Yeah, absolutely. The book is Walk On Warrior. Well, John, uh, man, we appreciate you taking some time. I, I, I know, especially, you know, with a two week old baby, th- like you said, probably sleep deprived and just got a lot of other stuff. So we, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on and chat with us about the book and about your career and, and about being a dad and uh, just best of luck to you and your wife with the, with the newborn. And again, uh, best of luck with the, with the book as well. Thanks guys. Yeah. I look forward to, uh, to following the podcast. Uh, have a great 2021. Hopefully it's better than, than 2020. And um, yeah, we'll be watching this football game tomorrow night. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, John. Have a good evening. All right. See you guys. All right. Well, we're going to go to a quick break. And when we come back from the break, we've got picks, picks, and more picks. We will be right back on Dad's Watching Sports. Coming up next week on Dads Watching Sports, the dads will talk some more NFL playoffs as we are headed to the conference championship games. Also, the dads will give you our way too early top 25 for NCAA football next year. And with Inauguration Day coming, we'll rank our top U.S. president dad moments of all time. That and more on next week's episode of Dads Watching Sports. Now check us out. We're listening to Dad's Watching Sports. Now back to the show. Now back to the show. Welcome back to Dad's Watching Sports. Michael Draper, Kyle Castles. Special thanks to John Wilcom for coming on and talking with us about Walk on Warrior and about uh, dad life and everything in between. Kyle, two week old uh, at home. He is a brave man. Uh, uh, the fact that the fact that he would jump on as the cat. Yep, there you go. Yep. You're you're muted there, Kyle. I think the, the, the cat <laughs> muted you. The cat muted me. Yeah. That's that is uh, top, um. <laughs> top five dads watching sports moment of all time right there. The cat walking in front of Kyle, stepping on the mute button as uh, as we're in the middle of the show. Uh, she yeah. Anyways, um, no, I, that was that was fantastic. I'm shocked his wife even let him jump on to a podcast for about 15 minutes like that yeah so maybe we should be thanking mrs Walcom for doing that for a lot thank of you time. mrs Walcom. yes thank you very much uh and congratulations on your new baby girl um kyle so last week on the show we talked briefly about that uh you and i had participated in a three-on-three basketball all-time tournament with the bracketeers we did a draft where we able to get two teams they put the bracket together we we put up the bracket and we talked hypothetically like how cool would that be if we had an all dads watching sports final 
Well, kind well of, we found out how cool it would we be. We found out exactly how cool it would be. And I mean, it's pretty cool. Uh, and so, yeah. Well, you wouldn't find it near as cool as I did. I, I found it very cool, to be honest with you. I, I, I okay. took a lot of I took a lot of pride in that. I was like, man, here, you know, here we are with what six other people that know sports or, th- or at least act like they know sports. And our show has the two teams that go to the final. So you had the Jordan led team uh, along with Mo- was it Moses Malone? Moses and- Malone and uh, yep. That's, who am I missing? That's exactly who it was. You know, quite frankly, it doesn't matter. I had Jordan and Moses Malone. <laughs> well, you had Michael Jordan. That's yeah. it. And I had the, the team of Steph, Vince, and Wilt. Um, and we made it to the finals. Um, but I will say uh, your Jordan-laden team did take me down. I think that it ended up being about a 60-40 to 40 vote. Uh, but yeah. congratulations, Kyle, on your three-on-three Look, tournament championship. Sometimes you just have to understand – I played college football. I know everything. Well, then let me ask you this. So they also, the Bracketeers, our good buddies over there, just put up a uh, tournament this past week that was the top college football national champions of all time. And they're in the finals, and they've got 0-1 Miami, which I think is a legitimate title team. Yeah. Against 98 Tennessee? Yeah, I don't. Come on. Yeah, I don't. I don't get that. There's something. There's something fishy there. Uh, I just looked it up. It was Paul Pierce. Paul Pierce. You should know that Kentucky yeah, guy. The truth. Paul Pierce was the third. So you know Jordan Moses and, and Paul Pierce. That's a pretty good uh, three man team. Not too bad. Uh, um, as far as this one, that '98 Tennessee team. There's so many, and we actually had this discussion uh, probably a lot longer than you wanted to have this discussion before the show. <laughs> But because uh, I just kept coming up with with teams, that I thought like, no, that seems better. Quite frankly, uh, and I think this is enough to prove that they shouldn't be there. Um, had the '99 Virginia Tech team been in the bracket, the same bracket with a '98 Tennessee team, the '99 Virginia Tech team that didn't win the national title, I guarantee you that team comes out of the bracket before the '98 Tennessee team. Because that 99 Vitek team was really, really good. Now, they ran into a buzzsaw that was Florida State, but that tells you the 99 Florida State team should have beaten the 98 Tennessee team. There's so many different – the 95 Nebraska, quite frankly, the 96 Florida probably could have beaten the 98 Tennessee team. There was a a, a Jim Trestle coached Ohio State team there in the early 2000s, I forget which year, that was really good. There was was, was enough out there that that 98 team shouldn't be there. Yeah, yeah, I – I don't know why that team made it. Uh, Chris LeBron says, oh, one Miami in a route. You may be biased, Chris. Uh, but, yeah. But Miami would win by four touchdowns in that game. Uh, oh, easy. Oh, TJ Burns says, hello, boys. TJ, happy to be here, sir. back, man. We missed you last week, TJ. We're, we're glad that you joined us. Uh, your Aggies, congratulations on your big win. Uh, looking forward to the Aggies finishing in the top five uh, this year. Top four. Top four, they, they definitely will. All right, Kyle. Uh, so a couple of things that I wanted to let the uh, listeners slash watchers be aware of, and we, we want to get some some interaction between uh, from from you know our diehard dads watching sports fans out there uh, on these two things. We teased this a little bit last week. We're going to tease it again. Uh, you know, we talked about the Peloton last week and about healthy living and working out and all this stuff. So we have decided we're putting together a dads watching sports fitness challenge. Uh, we haven't determined the what this is going to look like. This is going to come out in a couple of weeks. We're going to figure out what all that's going to look like. But what we want from our listeners slash watchers slash supporters out there is we want you to be in on this as well. There's got to be some dads out there that are also thinking, man, you know, I could lose a couple of LBs. I need some motivation. Um, so we want you to be involved. Uh, so if you have interest in being a part of the Dads Watching Sports Fitness Challenge this year, shoot me an email or shoot us an email the email address is coming up on the screen. It's dads watching sports at gmail.com. Shoot us an email to say, Hey, I want to be a part of the challenge over the next couple of weeks. We'll have some more details about what that's going to look like, whether it's a, you know, time spent doing activity or miles or steps or whatever, we'll come up with something. Uh, but we want people to be involved. So at the end of the year, we can look back and we can say like, look at all the dads getting healthy in 2021. So that's the first thing, Kyle. The second thing that I'm really excited about, is we know that, you know, there's going to be a point in time where there's going to be a lull in sports. We had it for an extended period of time last year because of COVID, but there's going to be a point in time where there's not going to be a lot of sports going on. And so I was try- I've been trying to think of some, what are some, some cool things that we can do on this show that 
really just kind of incorporate sports, but maybe not just talking about games every week or, you know, what's coming up next or things like that. And, and something that I've always really been fascinated by and passionate about is just fanhood, fandom, being a fan of sports. Like, how did you become a fan of this team? I think it's mainly because, you know me, I grew up in Mississippi, but I'm a diehard University of Kentucky fan. A lot of people would say, oh, did you? are, are you from Kentucky? Did you go to UK? And I have to answer no of those things. But then they're like, well, why are you a UK fan? And so I know there's so many people out there that have these really cool stories of either why you're a fan of your team or a really cool experience that you had as a fan of your team. And so, again, I think this would be really cool if we can get the dads watching Sports Nation involved. Uh, so we're going to send out some more information about this, but be thinking about it, fans out there. And you're, we're going to ask you to shoot us uh, some information or maybe even a video or something of you telling us why you're a fan of your team or if you have a cool story of why you're a fan or how you became a fan or a cool story of just you being a fan of your team. Uh, and we're going to compile all that. And then sometime probably in the spring or summer, we're going to have a fan show. Uh, it's going to be all about the sports fan. We're going to talk about why people are sports fan, fans of their teams. How did they become the fan of their team? Those types of things. And then we're also we're trying to get on a guest that has literally written a book about being a fan and why people become fans. Uh, so it's going to be the dads watching sports fan experience. Kyle, I can see it on your face. You're excited. Man, I look, I know my face probably didn't show it. I was just listening, going, "This is a because you texted this, but I feel like I got a lot more information in that." Um, and I was just taking it all in. That sounds really cool. Well, again, I, just trying to think, like you know, what are some things that resonate with with dads? And we're we're all fans. Uh, we're yeah. fans of teams, and so to to think about like how did you become a fan, or what's a really cool story that involves you being a fan of this team. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that would love to share that. And I think there was a lot of people that love to hear that. And so uh, I'm looking forward to talking about fanhood or fandom or whatever you want to call it yeah. uh, later on this year. Oh, I, I'm, I, I'm excited about the stories that people can tell. Um, yeah. Maybe we get TJ on. I see he just, he just commented on something uh, TJ on to tell us about, you know, what it's like to be at Kyle field and, 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 Maybe he was at, at at some Aggie yells and stuff, and like he can tell those like that kind of stuff sounds really cool to me. Yeah, yeah. So again, if you're a fan of the show or a listener or whatever have you, and you want to be a part of this, Dad's Watching Sports at Gmail dot com. And I mean, literally, I mean my my goal is we're going to have people re- either record themselves or we'll set up a, a Zoom call or something, and we want to do this via video. And I'm gonna we're gonna make like a whole little deal about uh, why you're a fan, and then again. We're going to have an expert come on and talk about why do people even become fans of teams. Uh, so I think it, I think it could be really, really cool. Um, okay, enough about that kind of stuff. Let's get into uh, some more topics here as we finish up the show, Kyle. Uh, so Trevor Lawrence this past week announced what everybody already knew, that he was going to be foregoing his senior season and entering the NFL draft. Nobody's surprised by that. Uh, had a rough last game, but still a lot of people think he is the number one pick out there. Uh, looking at the NFL draft coming up in April – is he your top guy, or who do you have going at the top of the board for uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars? The the I don't care if it's the Jags or if they decide they want to trade down and you know grab a quarterback later or whatever they decide they want to do. Um, the first pick is going to be Trevor Lawrence. Um, quite frankly, I don't know. If there's another player worth picking in that spot. Um, for for all intents and purposes, he is one of those can't miss type guys. He's John Elway, Peyton Manning, Andrew Luck. And I understand Andrew Luck didn't have the the, the career that, that Manning and Elway had, but uh, he struggled through some injuries that the other two didn't have to deal with. Um, but that's, that, I mean, that's how good Trevor Lawrence is. So when I threw out this topic, I so badly wanted to argue you and be like, there's no way it's going to be, it's not going to be Trevor Lawrence. You know, he's had this whole building up that he's going to be the number one pick and then somebody's going to sneak in. But, man, you really look across the landscape. And, like, I think what may happen is what you just said. I think the Jaguars might end up trading out of that. But somebody is going to – if they trade up, is going to trade up and they're going to pick yeah. uh, Trevor Lawrence. So, I think I think he'll be the top pick in the draft as well. I mean, here's the thing. If the dra- Jaguars fall in love with a quarterback further down, if they fall in love with a, a, a Kyle Wilson or a Trey Lance or – uh, who am I missing? Justin Fields. Maybe they can trade to two or three. You know, and grab one of those. Uh, Trey Lance, they could probably go down a little bit further. Um, so if, if they fall in love with one that's not Trevor Lawrence, uh, I I could see them doing it. But I don't 
I don't see them doing it. You, you, when you have a what feels like to everyone a can't miss prospect at the quarterback position that is a franchise changer, you have to take that pick. And so I don't I don't see the Jaguars getting out of it. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a shocker, uh, to be honest with you, if they ended up doing no matter if Urban Meyer is their coach or not, uh, which yeah. is, that might be trending in that direction. But, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll find out uh, in April. Uh, yeah. Speaking of football, uh, Kyle, you kind of led me on to this the other day. Um, so the, the Twitter handle or the, the name of the, the business or whatever you want to call it is College Football Revamped. Uh, they can be found at, at CFP Revamped, CFB Revamped on Twitter. Uh, and it sounds like, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, Kyle, but it sounds like essentially what they have done is they have taken the NCAA football 14, 2014 game, which was, correct me if I'm wrong, was the last year they released yeah. that game, yeah. and they have revamped it to include not only rosters and, and teams from the 2020 season, but the, whole, the look is a little bit different, and they've kind of done this all to where you can play it on PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and on your PC. So, essentially, they have created a 2020 college football game. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is that correct? That is essentially what they've done. Now, I, quite frankly, I don't know how legal it is. Well, I mean, but, but if nobody else is going to do it and they're not making money off of it, I mean, I don't know. You can't go after them to, to get money that should have been like EA Sports or whatever. Because, right. uh, quite frankly – what you've seen is you've seen people buying the EA sports NCAA 14 more. Now the price on eBay has gone up to about a hundred dollars a pop because people are seeing this and they're going, I need to get a copy so that I can do all of, and it's, it's a lot of work. You're downloading things. You're, 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 you're putting them onto the console and, and essentially like hacking the game. That's kind of what they've done to create these, these overlays on top of the game. So like I've done it. Uh, I, I'll be honest. I, I couldn't sleep the other night and literally like could not sleep. Uh, Cause I had two kids come get in bed and, and the last one came in at like three 30. And at that point I was up. So I was like, well, I got nothing else to do. Let me do this and just take a look at it. Um, and what they did is they built using the, the 13 uh, or the 14 version of the game built a game on top of it. Um, it plays just like the the original and all of that, but the the menus, uh, the logos, the uniforms have all been have all been changed. They they got the uniforms looking more like they do now versus you know what they look like seven eight years ago. Um, it's it's interesting. You, you can download rosters and it's all the new rosters. Um, I it's it's impressive what they've been able to do. Yeah, I mean, just what you're talking about is well over my head. And I'm thinking, man, how on earth do you even do that? Uh, but obviously there is a market for it. I mean, everybody and their mom who plays video games and who loves college football has been clamoring for an NCAA football game. I know I have uh, yeah. over the past five or six years. And now you kind of get it. Uh, and so it's it's really cool. So uh, congratulations to college football revamp for being able to pull that off uh, really quickly. With, with what seems to be kind of at least trending in the direction of some sort of uh, deal where the players may end up getting paid eventually. Do you foresee something coming back anytime soon? Or Not until the, the college players can unionize. Yeah. Um, Cause without it, they're going to have to go player to player and have them, unless you build it into the, uh, the, the, the letter of intent or yeah. the NIL, the national, help me out. What's it called? Um, I've gone blank. Um, the, 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 the paperwork you signed to accept the scholarship, right. unless it's built into that somehow, which I don't know how they would do that. Um, they, the players are going to have to unionize so that they can collectively bargain EA sports or, or 2k or whatever company decides they're going to make the game can collectively bargain with the players and, and, uh, let the union make that call. Let's go from the uh, guys that don't get paid yet to the guys that do. The NFL playoffs, we talked about at the beginning of the show, started this weekend. Uh, we had some some really exciting, some back and forth, some upsets. Uh, it was a really, really fun weekend of, of NFL playoff football. Anything that kind of particularly stood out to you? Uh, yeah, everybody knows I'm a Saints fan. There's, I got my shirt on again. Um, the Saints game today was – 
impressive to me. Uh, Drew, you know, it wasn't Drew throwing the ball all over the place like it's been for the Saints for you know the last decade or so. Um, the Saints really ran the ball and and controlled the clock. I mean, there was a time in the second half where the the Bears had run ten plays to the Saints almost thirty. Um, they ate clock. They ran the ball, uh, and, and if they can play like that with it, you know, the defense didn't give a touchdown to the final play of the game, and it took Jimmy Graham making a stupid one-handed reception, um, in in absolute garbage time. Um, it's a twenty-eight to three game. You know what I mean? So, and literally, it was a walk off. Like last play of the game uh, was that touchdown. So, um, the, if the Saints play like that, you know, I don't know that there's a team that can touch them. Now, can they? have that type of defensive performance against say a Buccaneer team next week or, you know, moving forward, um, a Packer team or, you know, to the Super Bowl, you're looking at, at chiefs or Ravens or bills. And you're talking about some good offensive football teams. Like, I don't know that the saints could do that, but we'll see. Yeah. A couple of games I watched were out of the AFC, uh, the bills kind of squeaking by the Colts there at the end, the Colts really some, Questionable coaching, uh, just to be honest, yeah. Yeah, out, of, out of Indianapolis. Uh, Bill's able to escape. And then the Titans and the Ravens, uh, back and forth game. Titans got up, Ravens came back, and then Lamar did Lamar things. Uh, and the, the, they just, the fact that the Ravens were able to shut down um, Derek Henry. Henry so much uh, was, was just really impressive. I did not foresee that coming uh, in terms of just the way they were able to shut him down. I think he had like 40 yards rushing, uh, which is. On like 18 carries. I mean, he had right at about two yards per carry. And for, you know, when you are two yards long anyways like he is, that means all he did was go out there and lay down at the line of scrimmage every play. Not a whole lot of push happening on that Uh, offensive line. All right, Kyle. uh, So picks last week. Now we still have a game that is in progress. It's 35 to 16, the Browns over the Steelers. Let's just, for argument's sake, say that that score holds uh, in some capacity and the Browns move on. If that's the case, we both went 5-1. and one. You lost this game. I lost the Titans and Ravens. So we will continue that uh, trend going in at both being 5-1. and one. But the first game we're going to go into our picks, Rams. The Los Angeles Rams got the win over Seattle in upset fashion. We both picked it. Uh, got that win. And now they are heading to the frozen tundra. Well, they will go and take on the Packers. I'll go first here. Uh, Rams played really well uh, against Seattle, but I just don't think they take that road magic on them with them again uh, to Green Bay and are able to pull it off. So I'll take the Packers in this game. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know who's going to play quarterback for the Rams. Uh, the backup, I forget his name. Um, he he got his he got his neck hurt on a hit early, fairly early in the game against uh, against the Seahawks, and I thought Jared Goff came in and, and put together a, a gutsy performance. Um, and it was it was cold there in C- in Seattle. I wouldn't say it's uh, freezing, but it was fairly cold. But he's just about a week and a half uh, out from thumb surgery. Mike, you've had surgery. Mm-hmm. I've had surgery. He's going to Green Bay, Wisconsin. No, thank you. It's not Seattle, right? Like Seattle, you know, it has a little more temperate being closer to the to the, to the ocean. We're talking about Green Bay. We're talking about chances of single digits at game time, maybe some snow. And you know as well as I do, when you've had surgery, especially when you're looking at maybe two or three weeks out of surgery, that cold's going to hurt. Yep. And that that thumb he had surgery on was his throwing hand. Look, I Cam Akers, that kid coming out of, of, of high school in Mississippi, I saw some video on him. He's legit. He went to Florida State, and just Florida State's not very good. Um, and so he didn't show it in college, but he's – a great running back. He, he's you know one of those future stars at the position. But come on, this is Green Bay. This is at the fro- in the frozen tundra in January. Get, yeah, Aaron Rodgers loves it. I'll take Green Bay. We'll stay in the NFC. You've got Brady and the Bucks coming to New Orleans. I know this one is going to be tough for you to pick, Kyle, but I'm putting you on the spot. Can your yeah. Saints continue their role uh, from what they did today, or does, does the Brady magic continue and did the Bucks walk out 
of New Orleans with a victory. Yeah. So, you know, they've already played twice this year. Right. And the Saints have rolled them twice this year. But this is Tom Brady in January. But I'm a Saints fan. You are. And I may lose this one. I think there's a good chance I lose this one. But give me the Saints to move on to the NFC title game and play the Packers. And taking the Saints, uh, Kyle, you know, I love you. Um, yeah. And I, you know, no, I, do it. I think you're, I think you're smart doing this. Well, but I, and I have admiration for your boy Breeze. And I know this is very likely could be his last, last go around, his last yeah. game here. Uh, but in, in ranking all time quarterbacks, Breeze is just a notch below uh, Tom Brady. And I think he's going to be a notch below uh, in this game. So I will take the Bucks to go on the road, get a win, and head into Lambeau the next week for the NFC championship. Uh, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, go, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I feel like if I was picking with my head, I would have picked with you, but I, I can't pick against the Saints. I understand. I completely understand. All right, let's switch it up just really quickly. We're going to the Hardwood College Basketball, West Virginia at number two Baylor. This is a good matchup in the Big 12. West Virginia uh, stumbled a little bit, but they're still a, a formidable team. Can they go down and knock off the Baylor Bears, or are you Baylor just keep rolling? Look, you put this on here for a reason, and I think it's because you want to pick West Virginia over Baylor. I can't. The only team I'd pick over Baylor right now are, are the Zags, and this isn't the Zags, so give me Baylor. It's not, but I did, and that is I am taking West Virginia. You can't count on Huggins uh, in a game where they're not supposed to win. They're going to grind it out, and I think West Virginia will go down there and shock the world uh, and knock off Baylor. No home court advantage with no fans there, Uh, and if it's a somewhat evenly matched up game, I'll take Bob Huggins over Scott Drew every single day of the week. All right, let's get back to the NFL Ravens, more than likely, if the, if the score holds tonight, it'll be the Ravens going to Buffalo to take on the Bills. You got Lamar versus the Bills Mafia. Yeah. What you got, Kyle? Well, look, so we're assuming the, 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 the score holds. Correct. I'm going to give you two picks in case, in case I'm, you know, the Steelers do something crazy. Okay. I, yeah, picking the, against the Ravens right now is, I think a really bad idea. Um, and so because of that, give me the Ravens over the bills. Okay. However, let's say that the Steelers can make a miraculous comeback and it's Steelers bills. Give me the bills over the Steelers. Okay. Okay. I like that. I like that. Um, so I'm just going to pick one. I, I just don't think that the Steelers are going to come back and win this game. And if I'm, Proved to fool uh, later on this week, then by all means, dad's watching Sports Nation call me out. Uh, Ravens versus the Bills. The Ravens are hot. They got Lamar. Uh, but I don't know, Kyle, if you happen to see the video that is surfacing around the internet uh, within the past 24 hours of what is supposed to be a gender reveal uh, mm. for the Bills Mafia, where the dad takes the son and throws him through a little table uh, into, the, um, into the cake. Uh, it doesn't get more hardcore than that. Uh, so I'm going just because they threw their kid through a table and a cake, I'm going with the Bills. Um, so that brings us to our final game. And this is, again, uh, anticipating that the score holds. We've had the Browns at the Chiefs. You got Patty, Patty Ice versus Baker. And all that offense from Cleveland. I'm going to go first. And I'm going to pick the Cleveland Browns to lose at Kansas City. Yeah, uh, I'll give you two picks again. So it's either the Browns or the Ravens. Um, and it doesn't matter. Yeah. The Chiefs are the best team in the NFL. Uh, I will pick the Chiefs in every game. If the Saints make it to the Super Bowl and they're looking at the Chiefs, I will still pick the Chiefs uh, to win. Because I, I I fully believe they are the best team in the NFL right now. Yeah, I agree with you there. It's uh, it's a little boring, but you know, you got to do what you got to do. You got to go with who you got. Yeah. Um, 
All right, Kyle. Well, that's all we got for this week's episode of Dad's Watching Sports. It's been a fun one. Again, special thanks to John. Welcome to joining us. Check out his book. It's Walk On Warrior. You can check it out anywhere that you uh, buy or listen to books. And we will be back next week, Kyle. We are giving our way too early top 25 for college football. I'm looking forward to including the Kentucky Wildcats in that. So we will see you next week on Dad's Watching Sports. Y'all take care. We'll see you. Bye.